One man dead and one man dancing. One flat on the ground, the other leaping high in the air. The dead man is Uzzah the priest. The dancing man is David the king. Readers of 2 Samuel often don't know what to do with either of them. That's how Max Lucado begins his chapter about this passage. Reading the passage, one might be tempted to say that at the center of all of this action is an object. The Ark of the Covenant, uh, constructed by Moses, made famous by Indiana Jones. Its specifications were precisely laid down by God. A wooden box, so many cubits by so many cubits, covered in gold. Inside were three artifacts, a jar of unspoiled manna from Israel's time in the wilderness, the walking stick of Aaron, which had budded long after it was cut, and the stone tablets, which bore the Ten Commandments. Three objects that were there as reminders. They symbolized God's provision, God's power, and God's precepts for the people. On the lid of the box were two golden cherubim facing one another, wings outstretched, their faces turned and bowed toward the space in between them, the mercy seat. If the manna, the rod, and the tablets symbolized God's provision, power, and precepts, the mercy seat reminded the people of God's presence. There I will meet with you, the Lord had said. In other words, the ark was there to remind the people, God is here. And it was the ark that had led the people into the promised land. Carried by the priests, it had been the very first thing to cross the river Jordan. Carried by the priests, it had circled the walls of Jericho and those walls had come tumbling down. And since then, the priests had cared for it in one place or another, except for one brief episode when it had fallen into the hands of the Philistines the people of Goliath, if you remember him. The Israelites had taken the ark into battle and lost it. It had seemed like a good idea at the time, but it was done without divine sanction. And yet the ark proved to be too hot a potato for the Philistines to keep. They put it in the temple of their god, Dagon, as a kind of trophy, but then every morning they'd found the idol of Dagon on his face before the Ark of the Lord. Terrified, they sent the Ark back to Israel like it was radioactive. And ever since then, for 20 years, the Ark had sat in a place called Kiriath-Jerim, Ignored, all but forgotten, much like that scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when it's crated up and wheeled into that vast warehouse. But now David was in charge, the man after God's own heart. He'd finally been crowned king, he'd captured Jerusalem, made it his capital, and now David was determined that the ark should come to Jerusalem. And here's the first lesson for us. As king, David was determined that the ark, which, which represented the provision and power and precepts and most importantly the presence of God, the ark should be at the very center of Israel's life. In other words, David's capital was to be the Lord's capital. 
His rule was to be God's rule. David recognized that even as king, he was still a man under authority. He was king by the grace of God. In similar fashion, when Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth was crowned in 1953, immediately after taking the coronation oath, she was presented with a Bible accompanied by these words. Our gracious Queen, to keep your majesty ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole life and government of Christian princes, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. This book, as long as it is not ignored, forgotten, or left to collect dust, is there to keep us mindful of the fact that we are a people under God. And the ark was there to keep David and the whole kingdom mindful of the fact that the Lord Almighty was in their midst. And so they loaded up the ark into an ox cart and began the 18-kilometer journey up to Jerusalem. And David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might. It was a time of, of great celebration. And Uzzah and his brother Ahio accompanied the cart on which the ark was being carried with Ahio leading and Uzzah apparently walking beside. And that's when it happened. They hit a piece of rough ground near the threshing floor of Nacon or something spooked the oxen that were pulling the cart and suddenly the ark shifted and Uzzah put out his hand and took hold of the ark and he died right there on the spot. Now something like that is bound to dampen anyone's festive spirits. And that's precisely what happened. The parade stopped right then and there and everyone went home and the, the cart with the ark was rolled up to the house of Obed-Edom and left there while David went back to Jerusalem to sort things out. Now why did Uzzah die? That's the the elephant in the room question this passage raises. Why did David's first parade end with a corpse? As Eugene Peterson puts it, it is difficult to fit this episode into our picture of the God who is consistently revealed as the giver of life, patiently calling us to repentance, constantly seeking the lost, undeflected, in his steadfast love for us. It doesn't sit easy with us when we come across an assertion that God kills. Judgment, certainly. But sudden death? The story of the slaying of Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament evokes a similarly puzzled response in us. What gives? We're not the first to ask that question. David asked it too. How can the ark of the Lord come into my care? If that's what the ark can do to a priest, what might the ark do to me and to Jerusalem? Over the centuries, people have always struggled with that question. And Regardless of the variations in emphasis, one answer has tended to emerge. It is fatal to take charge of God. Some people have pointed out that the priestly brothers Uzzah and Ahio completely ignored 
all of the instructions that the Lord had given for the handling of the ark. It wasn't to be placed in a cart pulled by oxen. It was to be carried by the priests. And even the carrying wasn't to be by direct contact. There were poles that were meant to be slid through rings in the ark's sides, and that's how it was to be lifted. And only after all the appropriate sacrifices had been made. In fact, the ark was something that was supposed to be so hands-off that when the temple was finally built by David's son Solomon and the ark was placed within it, only the high priest was allowed to approach within sight of it, and that only once a year. The book of Numbers even says that to touch the ark was to die. So the ark came with an owner's manual that had danger signs all over it. And Uzzah chose to ignore the whole thing. Others have suggested that Uzzah was someone who thought that perhaps literally he had God in a box. That it was his job to protect God from all the dust and mud of this world. That the the ark and therefore God were something to be managed by human beings. That he could be the gatekeeper who controlled access to the holy. Others have suggested that for Uzzah, the, the holy had actually become humdrum. The sacred second rate. That he became careless because he really didn't care. The ark had been kept in the house of his father, Abinadab, for years, and for Uzzah, it had become as familiar as the coffee table in the living room. However you phrase it, though, Uzzah's tragedy teaches us this. God exists on his own terms. He is present with us on his own terms. And to ignore those terms, whether immediately or ultimately, is something that leads to death. To set ourselves above God is to perish. The incident, perhaps surprisingly, reminds me of a scene from C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Children who have just entered Lewis's magical realm of Narnia are being told about Aslan, the son of the emperor over the sea. Aslan, of course, is Lewis's depiction of Jesus. And Mr. Beaver tells the children, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king. When it comes to God, no one has ever said anything about safe. Eugene Peterson thinks that every single church ought to be equipped with a sign that reads, Beware of God. Because life-changing, cart-overturning things happen in the presence of God. The warning, therefore, to those of us who, in place of the ark, have the Holy Spirit, to remind us that the Holy One is in our midst. To those of us who can approach the mercy seat, the throne of grace, not just once a year, but whenever we choose. To those of us who may own more copies of the Bible than we know what to do with and maybe even have a copy of the most valuable thing this world affords lying on our coffee tables. 
is quite simply this. Don't forget who God is. Don't forget that God is who he is and not who we make him out to be. Don't forget that the cherubim in Isaiah's vision have but one song they sing in God's presence. Holy, holy, holy. Don't mistake God for a genie in a bottle or a butler who's there to do our bidding. Don't make the mistake of thinking that he is there for us when in fact we are here for him. God is with us. There's no doubt about that. But he's with us on his terms, not ours. Three months pass while David shakes with fear, sulks in anger, and tries to make sense of why his great parade didn't go as planned. And in the meantime, Obed-Edom is blessed. Remember Obed-Edom? The guy in whose garage the ark got parked when the parade suddenly came to a halt? Since that day when David handed him that overly hot potato, Obed-Edom and all his household have been blessed. David must have wondered what on earth was going on. And it seems that he finally figured it out. Because David goes back to pick up where he left off. And yet, not exactly. This new parade actually follows a very different protocol. This time the ark's owner's manual is not only consulted but followed to the letter. First Chronicles 15 also tells us about this incident, and it says that the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles, as Moses had commanded, according to the word of the Lord. No more oxen except as a sacrifice, and no more carts, just those appointed by God to carry this symbol of his presence. And David? Once again, David danced before the Lord with all his might. And the sky doesn't fall, and nobody drops dead in their tracks, the dance goes on, and so does the parade, all the way to the place that David has prepared as the ark's new home. So here's another lesson. Perhaps much to our surprise, the respect that God expects does not require that we always be somber and sober and serious in God's presence. There's actually no need for us in worship or out of worship to look like those Presbyterians of a hundred years ago whose pictures hang outside our sanctuary. There is no need for us to be stone-faced or unsmiling. If David's dance shows us anything at all, it's that God is honored by his people's passion. See, Scripture does not record David dancing at any other time. But on the day that God came to town, at least metaphorically speaking, David just couldn't sit still. And in that moment, he wasn't particularly concerned about what anyone else thought. He knew that worship is something that's intended for an audience of one. In the eyes of some, including his wife, David lost his dignity that day. But in the eyes of David, 
the best thing in the universe was happening, the God of Israel was coming home with him. There's another scene from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that I want to share with you. One that happens late in the book. By this point, the children have come to know Aslan. More than that, they've come to love Aslan. And awfully, tragically, wonderfully... Just like the Lord Jesus, Aslan has offered his own life in place of another. In the gray light of dawn, after a night of death, Susan and Lucy weep over their loss. And then, behind them, there is a sudden noise. The stone table, the place of sacrifice, cracks. What's happened is that the deeper magic of the emperor over the sea has been released. Death is reversed. And Aslan stands before the girls, golden, glorious, and alive. And what do they do in that truly awesome moment? They dance. They dance with all their might until they collapse in a pile of golden fur and petticoats. Dancing with a lion. Dancing with the Lord. Wonderful? Obviously. Dangerous? Sure. Because if you dance with the lion, you will never be the same. Amen.